Paula. Thank you, Paula. I will make a very, very brief presentation to tell you what we'll be doing today and some of the changes we included in this technical forum of LACNIC. Bueno. Buenos días a todos. Gracias so, por estar. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to the new Technical Forum of LACNIC's edition. The Technical Forum today has a different format. We changed the structure and I will tell you briefly what this is all about. And also I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all the members of the community who collaborated in this edition. As Paula was saying, and I'm going to repeat what she said, the FTL, the Technical Forum of LACNIC is in a space as a space for exchanging knowledge and technical experiences. We had two face-to-face -face meetings in Panama and in Punta Cana, and the first virtual session was held last year. And now we meet once again via Zoom. The new format. A la vista del participante se parece a, a un evento uh, técnico. For participants, this looks like a common technical event, but it has a different structure. So we want to respond to things that are not dealt with with other technical forums in the community. We want to have greater flexibility with presentations selected by a co-program committee, but also guest presentations on new topics, panels, and eventually new issues, which we haven't thought of yet, but we'd like to have a space where you have the opportunity to test out new dynamics. We also want to have a space to attract new topics, to include new issues, and when one makes a call for papers, these don't come up because normally people, these are things that people are not working on, but we have a guess that these could be of interest. And we also want to have a space for what we consider is promoting new people. We are a very intensive community and we, have been for 20 years driving the community, but there are also other technical communities linked to universities or other organizations. So we'd like to relate to them and attract people from those communities in order to create a synergy and cross-pollinization between the different communities. Now, how did we structure the technical forum in this occasion? We separated the agenda management and the speakers in a program committee and then we separated from the agenda we wanted to have new topics so it's very difficult to have a program committee that covers the entire scope of knowledge for papers on almost any topic so similar to what happens in other academic conferences, we separated the evaluation pool from the program committee. The, we have two members of the staff and also one from the community appointed by LACNOG's board. In this case, this was Jorge Villa. We have a member of the community appointed by LACNIC's board, Wanda Perez from Dominican Republic, and four members of the staff who are Guillermo, Mariela, Ernesto, and myself, Carlos. The evaluation pool is not part of the program committee and they don't assess every single paper, but they assess one part that corresponds with their relevant expertise. In this occasion, this was the evaluation group, 26 people whom we wish to thank from the bottom of my heart for having dated dedicated part of their time to evaluate the different papers. We contacted them as new papers came up. Here we have the different countries participating. This is quite diverse, many from Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Costa Rica, Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, Italy, and some from Uruguay. Um, so to close my part and give the floor to the first speaker, we have today a guest presentation on MAP-T. This is a transition mechanism for IPv6, IPv4 to IPv6. And 
maybe it's not one of the most well-known tools, we thought it would be relevant to bring this today so that the community can decide whether they wish to use it or not. The speaker is Sander Trois. Sander, I apologize if your name is not pronounced properly, and he's Francisco. And then we'll have presentations on diverse topics, particularly IPv6, routing, and security, and some that are very difficult to classify because they cover many more topics. And to close the day, we'll have a segment that we tentatively called New Talents in Our Community. So we'll have presentations related to the mentoring program for women and technology that took place at the end of 2020 and beginning of 2021. Finally, I have a communication to share with you on behalf of my dear colleague, Laura Kaplan. This is a FRIDA program. The FRIDA program is a program to promote projects in the community. They opened the call, which will be closed on June the 11th. But I wanted to mention it in this technical forum of LACNIC because there is a working line of grants that is related to technical topics, particularly cybersecurity, resiliency, interconnection and operations. In 2020, there were several projects that received FRIDA funds. For example, uh, the Anycast Cloud of LAC TLD, Open Net Audit, deployment of IoT, and some, uh, some other topics that have been published, and you can read these. So without further ado, and not in order not to waste more time, I would like to give the floor to the first speaker of this morning, Sandra, the floor is yours. Let me share my screen here. All right. Perfect. There we go. All right. Um, hey, folks, uh, I wanted to um, uh, take some time here to uh, dis discuss uh, the well-known problem we have um, uh, uh, rising up more and more which is the issue of the IPv4 uh, address depletion. Uh, of course, there are many solutions available today, and, um, but they all have their pros and cons. And I wanted to uh, share with you a little bit of the technology behind what I think is a phenomenal solution uh, called MAPT, or uh, Mapping of Address and Port in a Translated Manner. So I try to do my best to pack this uh, big topic in the limited time we have available, but hopefully this will spark some interest with you folks. And uh, of course, if this um, uh, some more information is required or you'd like to uh, discuss this more for your uh, deployment or purpose, uh, be more than happy to have uh, uh, separate conversations together, never a problem. So <clears throat> um, the problem statement is simple, right? Uh, uh, IPv4 address space is limited, we're running out, and um, a common solution we are using today is uh, NET44 or NET444. That is kind of the standard that everybody is using to be able to um, map a private IPv4 address from a subscriber uh, and translating uh, the source IP address to a public routable one. Uh, that solution has been around for a long time, uh, but it has uh, significant limitations in today's networking environment considering the fact that it required, because any subscriber can grab any public IPv4 uh, and changing its source port, it requires in many countries to have extensive logging to be able to relate back who was using that public IPv4 address and port at that point in time um, uh, to be able to trace back to a, a particular subscriber. So besides the fact that you need to have designated hardware to do uh, CGN or NET444, which is already expensive, you also need to have um, a big database, depending on what the country requirements are, sometimes up to six months or even a year worth of historic translation data. Um, not only that, the other uh, issue with that is, is that any subscriber can grab as many translations as it uh, uh, potentially wants. And that can range up to about a thousand uh, uh, ports or tr uh, translations per subscriber, which can be quite significant in terms of uh, the scaling implications that it has. 
So um, if we are uh, reassessing the, the situation at hand and what options and alternatives uh, are there, if we could eliminate uh, the designated hardware required, if we can reduce the logging uh, overhead required, and using a technology like IPv6, um, uh, we can overcome many of those limitations. And that is kind of what uh, uh, MEPT is all about, um, uh, being able to address all these uh, uh, particular uh, cons of today's solutions and being able to uh, leverage some, uh, in quote, state-of-the-art uh, technology like uh, IPv6, right? So um, uh, the logging requirements of MAPT, but we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail as we uh, move along, um, uh, is very simple and can be leveraged through uh, the standard DHCP uh, uh, lease logging that you already have available anyway. So um, uh, while MAPT on, uh, uh, on PowerPoint or on paper sounds like such an uh, awesome solution then, um, uh, the, the, the migration towards this technology has been rather slow um, for all the obvious reasons. Um, uh, it requires an IPv6 infrastructure. Um, uh, some, of, uh, some of us don't have that 100% deployed yet. And of course, we always have to deal with uh, an IPv4 uh, 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 endpoint talking to the V4 uh, internet. So there will always be V4 uh, required and that you know is, is that makes um, uh, MAPT with IPv6 maybe a little bit uh, 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 slow to adopt. So, what is MAPT precisely? Interestingly enough, uh, MAPT was uh, uh, designed as a solution for a V6 native core and being able to provide V4 services uh, over the V6 underlay. So it was more like a, a transition technology to start rolling out uh, V6 uh, uh, more towards the edge. Um, the interesting part of MAPT is, is that it doesn't only translate uh, a, a native V4 address into a V6 address, but it also has the ability to translate the IPv4 address into a, a, a public IPv4. And that functionality is what I would say, you know, is, is that puts MAPT on the map and makes it a very um, uh, interesting solution. So the conceptually how it works is, is that DHCP uh, provides um, a set of parameters towards the um, uh, CPE, the, the subscriber endpoint, um, to basically have the standard IPv6 uh, uh, prefix to be used as well as the um, uh, lease as part of the standard DHCP solicit process. Uh, in addition, it provides some details to the CPE as to what translations to make from private V4 to public V4. And also it provides uh, <clears throat> details as to how to encapsulate the V4 address embedding it into a V6 address. Um, to uh, uh, DHCP and that functionality lives on the CPE. One of the beauties about MAPT is that it uh, is a stateless um, uh, translation technology. So if you know what the rules are for the translation, you can look at the IPv6 address uh, and translate it to a V4, or you can look at the V4 address and you know how to encapsulate it um, uh, with a V6 prefix. So that uh, functionality by itself makes it a very interesting technology as it can be, it can be done in line on any um, uh, uh, capable router in, in your network. You don't need a specific hardware for this, just the right software on your, uh, on your core or edge router. <coughs> the nice thing is, is that this functionality is also hardware accelerated. So there is uh, no control plane involvement as the rules can be implemented in pretty much any um, uh, hardware forwarder uh, a vendor has. Uh, generally, the implementation follows through uh, the policy-based routing infrastructure because the translation rules have uh, a lot of similarity to the way that standard uh, PBR or policy-based routing already works. So MAPT has a couple of components. 
um, uh, or terminology associated with it. And the most important ones are the BMR and the DMR. That is the base mapping rule and the default mapping rule. So a base mapping rule provides the endpoint, the, uh, uh, the notion of how to map um, uh, 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 an IPv4 address into an IPv6 address from a source address perspective. Um, the default mapping rule is similar to almost like a default route. It basically says, hey, you got an IPv6, uh, sorry, an IPv4 public destination, um, uh, but you need to send it through um, the BR or the border router. The BR or border router is that the device in your network that does the uh, translation between V4 and V6 for us. And that border router is designated with um, uh, an IPv6 prefix, and that is the default mapping rule. So we point effectively a V6 uh, destination towards that BR, and then the BR has the translation rules in hardware to unpack the uh, V6 portions of it, be left with the V4 public source and destination, and can exit it out uh, towards the V4 internet. Similarly, on the way inbound, the, the IPv4 destination in that case is again the, the border router. The border router has the translation rule here again in order uh, so it knows how to um, package up the V4 uh, addresses uh, encapsulated with a V6 prefix so that it can be routed back towards the subscriber CPE. Um, a typical uh, network, this doesn't look all that shocking, I, I know, but this is just to uh, explain how simple the technology is. Uh, conceptually, um, for subscribers, we generally have a BNG or a broadband next generation gateway or broadband network gateway. Um, and the subscriber from the CPE uh, towards the B, uh, BNG is just a standard IPv6 only um, subscriber session. We have a MAPT border router somewhere uh, uh, on the edge of our network, but technically it can reside anywhere. Um, and that one would face uh, interface with the, uh, uh, with the public IPv4 network. So it is pretty, um, uh, all the standard components of the network you probably already have uh, can be uh, reused in this case. So what does uh, MAPT translation precisely do? Um, there is a, effectively a, a, a translation happening two times. The most, in quotes, complex one is done at the CPE. Um, I call it here stateless, but that is not 100% true. Uh, even though the translation of a V4 into a V6 is stateless, that is done by the rules given um, through the MAPT uh, DHCP exchange, right? Um, however, there is also a component that uh, the, v, uh, the private V4 is translated into a public V4. And uh, most likely associated with a source port change as well. For that reason, obviously, there needs to be a stateful table inside the CPE, but this is no different than the standard NAT44 that the CPE already does by nature uh, today. So, um, uh, yeah, that is the second point that I made, right? The NET44, uh, the way that it was before on the CP is exactly the same in, in a MAPT deployment. The added component to that is the uh, translation of the now public V4 into the V6. That is stateless, and that is done on the CP as well as on the border router. So, um, the, the best part of uh, MAPT is that um, uh, it provides for a lot of address con uh, conservation uh, as multiple CPEs will share the same public IPv4. And uh, the specific portion of that is, is that in the uh, MAPT deployment, um, you assign a port range towards the subscriber. You can either have it leverage 128, 256, 512, uh, whatever number of ports, as long as it's a factor of two, of course, a number of ports that can be assigned to the CPE. The fewer ports you allocate to the subscriber, the more CPEs can hide behind that um, uh, IPv4 address. 
Now, here is a key critical part, right? Because this, to some extent, is being done with uh, uh, a CGM or Net 444 already also. We can define how many ports a subscriber may use. Uh, the major difference is that in uh, a MAP-T um, scenario, the subscriber ideally is dual stack, V4 and V6, meaning that if devices are V6 capable, going to a V6 destination, think of an iPhone going to Google or uh, your mom's PC to the, um, uh, to the Facebook, that is all native V6. So you don't need V4 uh, translation for that you get an ample amount of extra savings uh, if you go for a deployment like that. Um, yeah, so the, the, uh, the bar that is the, what I'm explaining here below is, is that uh, from a standard 16-bit source port that is already there, a number of bits that you define is going to be what is called a port set or a port set ID that defines effectively the port range that this subscriber is identified by. So a, uh, in MAP-T deployment, a subscriber CPE is effectively identified by its V6 prefix along with the port set ID it is using. So let's uh, walk through a standard translation and what that looks like. So um, on the left-hand side, we have a, a V4 uh, endpoint. In this case, a laptop is being drawn. He has a private yellow IPv4 address. That packet is being sent towards the CPE, and the CPE um, uh, does, uh, has received a public IPv4 uh, address uh, through the, um, uh, the DHCP uh, exchange, as well as a port set ID or a source port range. The, uh, the CPE is performing now a, a private IPv4 into a public IPv4 translation, which is shown here um, uh, in the two um, uh, uh, rectangles, translating the yellow uh, V4 source to a uh, public uh, V4 source in blue. At the same time, very important also is, as we said, the source port needs to be changed because chances are, that the client source port that he used uh, is not within the port set range, and therefore we need to make that translation. So now we are ending up with a perfectly public IPv4 routable source and destination. Uh, it is this red uh, arrow that is basically the stateful part of the translation, no different than what CPEs do today. Then the stateless translation of uh, composing uh, an IPv4 address into an IPv6 address uh, is part of the MAP-T. What we're doing here is, is that um, we're using part of the uh, IPv6 address uh, uh, space to embed uh, uh, the, native trans uh, uh, the native fee source addresses, the ones in blue. Um, we do that. Uh, the, the destination is the most simple one of them all, is because we're taking the border router v6 prefix um, and append it with the, the destination public IPv4, and that we ship out. V6 routing-wise, this packet is going to land on the border router, who knows what the default mapping rule is, aka what the external V6 prefix is. It will strip that off and ends up with the public IPv4 destination. On the, the source uh, uh, address side of things, the CPE has been provided a, um, uh, an IPv6 prefix um, during the initial subscriber uh, DHCP setup. Um, we have the translated IPv4 uh, public uh, address. We uh, append the v6 prefix with the new uh, uh, public IPv4 in blue. We also add the port set ID to it um, as, an, uh, as the number of bits. So the IPv6 address that you're ending up with is really the CPE v6 prefix that is public, of course. We have the um, IPv4 public uh, uh, source IP address, the one from blue, and uh, composed with the port set ID. Um, uh, and, and that is then being shipped out to, uh, to, the, to the border router. 
on the border router uh, uh, defined by the default mapping rule knows exactly what the fix prefix length is for the CPEs and uh, what the port set ID size of that is. So that needs to match from the DHCP server onto your configuration of the uh, MAPT border router. And that way it knows exactly how to unpack the IPv6 uh, address and end up with um, uh, the V4 uh, 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 public IPv4 address. Okay. Hey. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the two boxes on the right. Uh, that is basically what I just described, right? Uh, how the border router is unpacking the uh, V4, the public V4 source and destination, out of the um, uh, V6 addresses. Again, that is a stateless translation and uh, generally hardware accelerated. Okay. This uh, looks like the same uh, slide, and it uh, pretty much is. But what I wanted to uh, convey with um, uh, with this visualization is is that if uh, a client is a dual stack, uh, if if your deployment allows for that, then um, uh, the client will automatically um, uh, use a source v6 for a, a, a v6 destination. In that case, the CPE is not doing any translation whatsoever. Uh, the packet may or may not go through the border router, regardless of that, um, because the destination uh, v6 address is not the, the border router uh, prefix, the MPT border router in this case would just naturally uh, route this packet through and would not be subject to any uh, translation, of course. Um, I think that this is the true power of uh, a MPT deployment, being able to go from v6 uh, uh, source to destination and only when you have a, a, a V4 destination that is only found via the V4 internet, um, MAPT comes into play, whereby the CP is doing the translation for the majority of the work and the MAPT border router doing the unpacking for it. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, um, not that I, uh, that I want to make this a marketing uh, slide for, uh, for MAPT at all, but I, I would want to call out a couple of the, uh, the benefits that, um, that you would have being able to um, uh, uh, leverage uh, this, this technology, right? So uh, you get the, the highest uh, um, reuse of, uh, of public IPv4 addresses, especially when you're keeping your port ranges uh, uh, very small. And you can keep the port ranges very small because V6 uh, uh, native technology is there if your clients are dual stack. You get the highest um, uh, conservation from it. Also, MAPT doesn't require a dual stack. Your savings get incrementally more uh, if you're able to leverage that. So, um, uh, yeah, a couple of um, uh, advantages and benefits. I think that that is um, uh, uh, important to articulate. Is that, um, of course, this, the statelessness of the uh, the implementation, namely at the border router, is um, very interesting for us as providers. Whereas, you know, with uh, DS Lite and Net64 and CGN Net444, uh, it requires a lot of uh, extra devices, compute, logging requirements, and what have you. So with MAP, you don't have any additional logging requirements uh, or implementation necessary besides of what your V6 um, uh, DHCP server uh, already does by nature. So um, it also helps with the um, um, uh, being able to disjoint V4 and V6 deployments. Obviously, you need to have a part of your network V6 enabled, namely between the BNG and your border router, but they can be very close if you want to. Uh, however, I would recommend a design whereby your MAPT border routers are as close to your V4 internet as much as possible. Um, simply also because that provides for a lot of redundancy. Think this, the default mapping rule, that is the MAPT border router destination, it can be an AnyCast address as well. So you can run the MAPT border router on multiple gateways with the exact same rule set. 
and there is no state synchronization necessary. This provides for natural load balancing as well as um, uh, beautiful redundancy native in the solution. Um, this you all sounds to, to, be, to be true, right? Oh, no, okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you for the heads up. <laughs> uh, yeah. This all sounds too good to be true, uh, but, it, but it really is. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions. Uh, that means you know, that NFT will not handle IPv4 packets with options, but who does need that anyway? Also, ICMP support, because it has no ports, uh, is very tricky. So most implementations do not support anything else but ECHO. This may break uh, path MTU discovery, uh, but only a consideration if the MAPT border router would be the smallest MTU hub. You can easily avoid that. Also, fragmentation uh, is not supported in MAPT simply because in subsequent fragments, there is no L4 information, and that is what we need in order to be able to make the translation happen. So um, because we're unfortunately running out of time, uh, and I try to keep this as summary, uh, summarized as possible, um, uh, I will quickly glance this here on the screen for everybody to, uh, to give a look. Uh, I think it is clear based on, uh, or clear, I hope that I conveyed the point um, uh, uh, well enough what the advantages of, um, of a MAPT deployment are. I also have a, a nice slide comparison for you over here that uh, details out what the different technologies are available and what the pros and cons are of each individual solution. Um, the only consideration that I hear a lot from people why MAPT may not be usable or the desired implementation for them is simply because it requires a MAPT capable CPE. Good news is, it, is, uh, it has been out there for a long while already uh, and part of the open WRT uh, uh, implementation. So it should not be that hard to, um, to leverage this technology. Um, in the backup slides, uh, I'm sure you guys are interested about this now. Uh, in the backup slides, I have some details as to how we have implemented it in uh, iOS XR, um, uh, or iOS XR uh, Cisco routers and uh, a couple of configuration examples and explain as to what this, uh, you can see that the configuration is super simple for uh, a border router. Um, uh, yeah, so if case you like to play with it, uh, you can copy paste this and it should just work for you perfectly. All right, fortunately Thank out you. of time. If you guys <laughs> have one more have... questions, please reach out. Sure, we have time for one question and we have one question in the Q&A. Uh, the question is in Spanish, so I'm going to do my best job trying to translate it for you since uh, you don't need to change anything. So since you are on uh, phone audio, let's minimize the chances of uh, something going wrong. So here is the question. Uh, the question is being asked by Hugo Rivera Martinez. And the question is, are, are two routers necessary? What happens if I only have one CPE connected to the internet in which the LAN has both IPv4 and IPv6 and the ISP has two different EBGP sessions? I, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, even in Spanish, but perhaps you, you, you can help me there. Um, yeah, the, the, um, I, I'd like to discuss that more. Um, so please uh, connect with me offline. Um, uh, if I understood the question correctly, um, uh, you, uh, in a MAPT deployment, you need uh, two pieces for that. That is uh, the piece that does the V4 uh, translation from private to public, and separately the encapsulation of the V4 address into V6. That is done on the CPE uh, typically. Um, the other piece to that is your uh, MAPT border router that does the unpacking. In between that, it needs to be IPv6, but they can be as close together as, you, as your deployment requires. So basically at the bare minimum, you have a single IPv6 only LAN between the CPEs and some border router that would be a minimum, minimum implementation. Okay, okay. Correct. Yeah. So Sander, Thank you very much. This was very interesting. This is a topic that I don't think has been presented before in the Lightning conferences. So thank you very much. And I'm quite sure you will be uh, getting more questions uh, in the future. I'm sorry, Sherry, we are really out of time. 
Uh, there's another question, Sander, maybe you want to take it on the chat, uh, but we really need to move to our next presenter now. Thank you very much. And uh, we certainly appreciate you being part of the FTL. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you for the opportunity. Bye, guys. Bye bye. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias, Sander. Y ahora... Thank you very much, Sander. And now we continue with the next speaker by Fernando Gont, who will be speaking about RFC 8981 extensions for temporary addresses for IPv6 Slack. And let me remind you, Fernando, that you have 20 minutes for your presentation. You have the floor, Fernando. Can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Yes, we can hear you. We still cannot see your presentation. All right, can you see it now? All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Fernando Gont. I'm security, information security at Edge Uno, and I'm going to make a presentation on RFC 8981 on temporary address extensions for IPv6 Slack. So let us start with a brief introduction on this topic on temporary addresses. Basically, if you look and analyze the traditional Slack addresses, these had bad privacy properties because these addresses generated or continue generating the interface identifier embedded in the underlying MAC address. In other words, to generate an IPv6 address, I link the prefix of the network that I have in the local network with the MAC address of the interface of the underlying network. Now, this issue of including a MAC address in the interface identifier can be used or in practice ends up becoming a super cookie. In other words, it includes a value which is unique and stable that allows somehow to identify the system that is using that address at a given moment. And this has happened for many years now, for 15 years. These issues of privacy became evident in IETF. So what we did was to introduce the concept of temporary addresses. Basically, temporary addresses are aimed at generating IPv6 addresses at random and with a short lifetime in order to do client type operations, namely outgoing. This does not solve all the security and privacy issues that the I traditional IPv6 addresses has, but at the time, this somehow mitigated the most pressing problem, which was that situation in which any system, when exposing the MAC address in an IPv6 address, revealed the identity and could do quite easy tracking of that system. So how does this scheme work or how did this work, this issue of temporary addresses, which was specified in RFC 4941. This is a system that is a legacy one, but the current specification was the one it had until the beginning of this year. So in the past, this worked as follow. Basically, this RFC, this specification states that the systems that implement this standard will generate temporary uh, addresses basically in addition or together with the stable addresses. In other words, they have the traditional stable addresses and apart from that, they generate the temporary addresses. Basically, this is generated with a random ID and limiting the lifetime artificially. That is why they are temporary. And we in, they introduced these new values, the preferred lifetime for the preferred which is one day, and the valid one, which is one week. Con lo que es IP versión 6 Slack, esta es terminología tanto de prefer como de valid lifetime, terminología de lo que es Slack. ¿Sí? This uh, is the terminology of a Slack. And uh, these values basically tell us that a given address will be used for new conditions for one day, and it can be used for a maximum time 
of one week. What else can we say about RFC 4941? If you think of the number of concurrent addresses that a, a system may have at a given time, that value can, is the quotient, the ratio of these two values, the valid lifetime and the preferred lifetime. Um, and again, for this ratio to be magic, then just use the terminology and the concept of slack in IPv6. So when we um, calculate this ratio, if I have a system in a network and I leave it connected uh, for a week at a certain time, the system will be capable of using seven temporal uh, addresses per prefix. That's quite, quite high value. The other thing that we can say about RFC 4941 is that the temporary addresses are disabled by default. And the norm said basically that this needs to be the default behavior. And so far, that would basically be the way we have specified RFC 4941. Now let's see what are the problems that this entails. The first problem has to do with the fact that the interface identifier gets regenerated or changed only on a time basis. That is, that I create a random ID and with a certain regularity, I'm going to regenerate it or change it. That's the only factor that will make me change or regenerate that ID. So these Interface identifiers uh, will be regenerated into the fixed periods of time. That is, at the next time, what we, we had seen before that it was one day. Another thing that happens as a consequence uh, of uh, changing this based on time is that you can use the same interface uh, identifier for different networks. And or the other thing is that if I'm logged to a multi-homing in IPv6, I'm going to use the same interface identifier for multiple different prefixes. And the consequence of this that I mentioned is that it will be possible to correlate. Time-based correlation, space-based correlation, and I'm also going to be able to have multi-homing correlation. In other words, what I tried to avoid or to mitigate with the temporary addresses is still possible. That is um, this correlation. Let me give you some uh, specific examples of correlation. Let's start with space-based correlation. Let's assume that I have a system that generates a, a random ID. Out of simplicity, I put A, B, C, D, but of course that would be a 64-bit random value. And my system gets connected to a number one network and um, i'm going to put the random id identifier and if now go to a net a second network the prefix change but the uh interface id is the same because its life is given just by time nothing is telling me that if i switch networks i have to change the iid now when uh, the uh, lifetime is due I have to generate a new one. Instead of ABCD, it's one, two, three, four. And if my system moves uh, in um, uh, time to a third network, now the prefix changes. You see that one uh, in green, and now I'm going to have one, two, three, four. And in a fourth network, the prefix already also changes, but notice that the interface identifier is the same. So it only varies based on time. And the same applies if I go to a delta time uh, further in the future, I have network five, a new address, and if I now go, now go to uh, network six, the prefix changes, but the interface identifier remains constant. So reusing an interface identifier for different network prefixes enables me to correlate activities, and that's not a desirable thing. So how can I correlate with time? I have two different things. Now, I won't change the network. I'm always in the same network. However, you will generate the first uh, ID, and now I do different activities. For instance, outbound uh, connections with the system. I have two things there. First of all, that after a certain period, of, for, for a certain period of, of time, I'm going to be using the same IPv6 address, nothing new. Now, as long as I reuse that, uh, the activity will be cor correlatable. 
Other thing that, uh, things that I have to consider is that I said that the interface identifiers are generated with a certain regularity. When I am run out of the Delta 1, uh, the lifetime of the initial identifier, I'm going to generate a second IID. All of the activity in that uh, new Delta of time will be done with the second interface identifier. Obviously, something that you can see in this slide is that it is quite obvious that once the first uh, delta time uh, 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 finishes, then I start using a new one. So any attacker that knows the delta period of time, that of course it's known because it's specified by um, the standard, can infer the attacker can identify by when the IID will change. So from the first time that they will see an address with a certain IID, they measure the data time and he knows that after the data time, it, the, it, the IID will forcibly change. And a delta time later, I will generate a new interface uh, identifier. And once again, you see that uh, the uh, network activity will have the new identifier for each delta time. Everything that to do with the same address can be correlated. And the other thing that we need to take into account here is considering time correlation, is that as an attacker, I can infer or guess or predict when the interface uh, identifier will change because of the lifetime. Because uh, obviously it's specified by the standard itself. It's a, it's a fixed lifetime. Es un escenario de lo que se conoce como multi-homing. The third is the uh, correlation is multi-homing. In IPv6, multi-home, well, there are several ways you can interpret them. One of them is using multiple prefixes in a single network. So let's consider the case where I have a system, I connect to a single network, I don't switch from uh, one network to the other, and based on the uh, temporary um, IIDs, I generate the first. If, if I have multiple prefixes in black and in blue, and I'm going to configure two addresses, one for each prefix, but using the same IID. That's random, temporary, but I use the same for the two prefixes. A delta time later, that is when the lifetime of this first interface uh, identifier is over, now I'm going to generate a new interface uh, identifier. And uh, the same thing happens. I configure addresses for each prefix, but with the new IID. Obviously, notice that I have two different prefixes that, uh, to begin with, would appear to be of a completely different network based on the prefix I can't correlate it. However, if I'm using an interface identifier that is globally unique and statistically can be expected, and is the same for the two prefixes as an attacker. I can correlate the activity of the two addresses. And obviously the same thing happens when a data time later, you generate a new interface uh, identifier. Once again, I generated an address for each prefix and the two addresses use the same interface identifier. So these are three scenarios where basically the temporary address uh, uh, setting permit you to identify activity, something that is absolutely not desirable. Other things that need to be borne in mind. One of them is that the address lifetime is maybe too long. I said that the valid lifetime is one week at the most. And if I can see, if you consider temporary addresses as something that should be transient, then a week is far too long, almost eternity. So this is something that retrospectively you would think that it should be shorter. Now this lifetime, as I said earlier, when you consider the preferred and the valid time, here you have a very high number of concurrent addresses. And as a result, uh, there, uh, there are too many addresses at the same time. Uh, and it's a problem for devices that for instance, inspect a net neighbor discovered inspection because they need to have a state uh, for each of these addresses. Another issue that you need to consider is that uh, RFC 4941 requires stable addresses along temporary addresses that, that is in addition to, that is, I need 
for so with temporary addresses i'm still required to generate stable addresses and although in general terms this may be adequate when you speak of mobile devices it could be not desirable because in a, with a mobile device usually you consume information um, so that is for client activity so it might not be necessary to use stable addresses finally rfc 4941 tells us that uh, the uh, temporary addresses must be disabled by default most popular implementations of in ipv6 go against this recommendation that is they enable the temporary addresses by default but the standard told me that these temporary addresses need to be disabled by default now the this is a set of problems that are present in rfc 4941 we've used it for many many years basically until early this year in recent years, jointly with uh, some co-authors, personally, I worked uh, reviewing this standard. And early this year, we published RFC 8981. Its main objective was to solve all the problems of uh, the traditional temporary address specifications. So summing up the, uh, the changes that are introduced uh, in RFC 89. 81. First of all, each temporary address employs a different randomized IID. What does this mean? That they are not reused. When I move from one network to the other, the interface identifier will change, like it or not. And on the other hand, if I connect uh, to a multi-homing network, that is, that uses multiple prefixes, the address that I can, the temporary address that I configure for each of those prefixes will use a different interface identifier. So I mitigate the correlation problems that I mentioned earlier. Another issue is that in RFC 8981, we use random intervals. Here you have uh, the, uh, the way you estimate the lifetime for uh, a certain address and it will go uh it will range uh, randomly from 0.6 from the preferred lifetime to the preferred lifetime so that the temporary uh, ids will not be regenerated uh, with a with a predetermined uh, sequence your interval but the timeline is random so it's much more difficult to predict when these addresses will be regenerated so we change the lifetimes and specifically we change the maximum valid lifetime we it was reduced from seven to two days and we have a maximum number of concurrent addresses it, that's three compare this against uh, the seven that you had uh, you had seven concurrent addresses based on RFC 4941. What else did we do? We removed the requirement uh, for stable addresses. You no longer require them. So you, if you have a mobile device, you can only configure temporal uh, um, addresses because that's the norm, the standard allows it. And finally, we changed the default setting so in RFC 8981, we say that the temporary addresses are enabled by default. In this last issue, specifically, as I said earlier, basically what we did was to match the specification with the real implementation. So you may wonder, well, the, they published the standard. What happens in practice? How is this implemented? Well, we have the open bsd slack d i participated in part of this uh, full implementation we have another implementation that is almost complete in the linux kernel i also did it and then we have a patch for the free bsd kernel and as far as i checked uh, it hasn't been applied so if you have the contact with the developers you may insist for the patch to be applied 
Eh, bueno, la primera es que el, lo que es el desarrollo del RFC 8981 eh, se benefició mucho de trabajos de investigación que muchos de nosotros hicimos en los años recientes, eh, recientes por eso básicamente eh, este RFC, esta última norma, soluciona todos los problemas. Thanks for working simultaneously both on the standard and on the standard itself, we managed to reduce the time to market. So by the time the RFC was published, it was in February this year, at least there was one full implementation of this RFC. So are there any questions? Yes, we have a question here from John Velasco. He says, if you use temporary ones, how does this become integrated with the security tools that depend on the synchronization with Active Directory and that would be affected by the use of multiple addresses for one single user? Well, that's an excellent question. And let me summarize this as follows. There are two ways of configuring the addresses DHCP v6 and IPv6 Slack. The problem with DHCP v6 is that it's not support Android and with Slack, it's because this is just anarchy itself. So if you wish to trace, if you wish to maintain a mapping of what the system, system is using which address, you have no way around it, but forcing the use of DHCP v6 that could or not be possible, or option two, to use an additional tool, which so far you hadn't used, in order to do an active mapping between addresses and systems. This could be a daemon that you put in some part of the network, or you could also run some tool which does a query of mappings that it can establish in a dynamic way in switch. But you do have a problem here. Precisely for this reason, many environments such as enterprise disable the temporary addresses or even using DHCP v6 in Slack. So any more questions? No more questions. So thank you very much to everyone. This is the slide with my email address. So if you have any additional questions, feel free to write to me. Can you see those okay? Okay, perfect. Go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. So once again, my name is Kenneth Olmsted. I'm a senior policy advisor at the Internet Society and a co-lead of our measurements project. I want to introduce our Pulse platform today that we were very excited. We launched um, earlier this year. Um, so first, why are we measuring the internet? Um, the Internet Society is committed to a globally connected, open, and trustworthy internet. The measurement project's goal is to measure the health of the internet to further those values. Who are our audiences? So first, really just the public. This is not an academic exercise. We are really trying to make data about the health of the internet accessible to everybody. And I think given this past year, um, everyone is very aware of how important the internet is, um, and our goal is to make sure um, that it stays that way. Um, we also we use it internally to support our other projects. We have six other projects at the Internet Society, and um, they also use our data to further their, um, their work. Um, so, for example, we build IXPs around the world, and they use our measuring data um, to support that. We use third-party data for all of our measuring. We have about 10 data partners. Um, we also measure trends of all of this data. So we generate blog posts and reports and lots of other material to um, measure the health of the Internet going forward. Um, this is free on our platform, uh, pulse.internetsociety.org. Um, so if you want to poke around, feel free. Um, we have four um, main focus areas currently, um, internet shutdowns, enabling technologies, internet resilience, and internet centralization. I'll go through each of them as individually. The last two are not live yet. Um, we hope to have them in the coming months, um, but the other two are. So first, internet shutdowns. Um, what is our definition of internet shutdown? We only measure intentional shutdowns when governments turn off um, the internet for some reason. So we don't measure cable cuts or network outages or anything like that. We have an ongoing database of shutdowns that goes back to around 2019, um, and we keep it maintained going forward. Um, we work with data partners, including Access Now and CADA, to measure um, all of these shutdowns. So we do this in real time. We have researchers who are watching the health of the internet to see when a government shuts it down. 
to make that decision to include it in the database, we had two criteria really. Um, one is, like I said, it's artificial and we needed a second source to verify it. So for example, um, if the government puts out its own statement saying why they shut it down, or there's a trusted um, news source like the AP or um, something like that, that's when we decide to put it in our database. And we usually also release a statement um, about that shutdown. The Internet Society thinks shutdowns are bad, essentially. And that's our goal, is to measure these around the world to see how often they happen, um, why they happen, and to sort of make the case to governments around the world that even if it seems like a good idea to turn off the Internet, it really isn't, and it hurts your own people. Um, we only have data going back about two years, so we have not released any longitudinal reports yet, but that is our goal going forward. We hope to have a sort of um, state of the internet report at some point that goes over all of the shutdowns that we measure. Um, we just simply don't have enough data yet, um, but we that hopefully we'll have that um, soon. Oh, I should also say we work closely with our chapters in this, um, this effort. Um, we really need stories of people on the ground when this happens. So that's where we rely heavily on our, some of our chapters around the world. We have around 200. Um, so for example, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a shutdown and we got um, one of our chapters in Africa to actually write a story saying, I live in this country and this is what happened. So that is something we really rely on to sort of color this data. Um, and so in that vein, we will accept stories from anybody, not just our chapter members. So if you live in a country where you experience a shutdown, um, please reach out to us. We really love hearing um, and having that information to really make the case that these, you know, these shutdowns harm real people and have real consequences. So the next one that is currently allowed on the site is enabling technologies. Um, this measures um, the global use of, at the moment, on the technologies IPv6, TLS 1.3, DNSSEC, HTTP3, HTTPS. Um, we get the data from various sources, um, and we have a map where you can click around and see um, the adoption of these technologies. And we have data going up again back about two to three years at this point. Um, and we measure, we measure over time um, how much these technologies are being adopted. Um, the reason we do that is we think that these technologies are really important to the health of the internet. Um, and we wanna make, make it clear that adopting them is incredibly important. Um, we also use it to um, help with regional advocacy around the, around the world. Um, again, we work with our chapters very closely to push governments and, and companies to sort of adopt all of these as much as they can. Um, I should say we are constantly expanding this list. We're actually currently in the process of trying to figure out what to do next with these. Um, so if anyone has any ideas or wants to add something, please feel free to reach out to us. We're always interested in talking to the techno community um, to really fill in gaps in global measurement of these technologies. And so we'd be happy to work with anybody um, who has ideas. Internet resilience, which I mentioned before, is not live yet, but we actually will be releasing the methodology for this project in about a week, so stay tuned for that. Um, this currently is being piloted in Africa, but our goal is to um, expand it globally at some point. Um, what we, internet resilience is really trying to measure the health of the network in this, and so when something goes down, can the network bounce back, basically. Um, I won't go through the methodology right now because we don't, frankly don't have time. It's fairly long and fairly detailed. But basically, we collect lots of data sources, including um, uh, power networks, um, fiber cables. Um, we use um, lots of other measurements. We have um, network probes around countries in Africa. Um, again, we haven't actually released this data yet. And we probably won't be putting it on the site for another couple of months because um, there's just a lot of data crunching to do. We've got about I would say 13 to 14 variables that we're measuring and trying to put up into a single resilience number. Um, so we can say, you know, X countries network is resilient in this way. Um, if anyone has any questions about the methodology, I'd be happy to get super nerdy about it. We just simply don't have time right now. Um, and again, we will be releasing it in full next week. And so just stay tuned for that if you're curious about the nitty gritty um, sort of nerdiness of this. Um, and then the, really the goal of this is to, at least in Africa, start to build relationships with governments um, and companies around there to um, help them sort of make the network more resilient. And again, we will be expanding this globally at some point. But again, this is a fairly complex pilot program, so we don't really have a timeline for um, expansion quite yet. We really want to focus on Africa first, particularly because Africa's um, network are particularly vulnerable compared to, say, Europe or the United States. And so we will um, we'll hopefully learn a lot of lessons through that process that we can um, sort of copy paste in other countries. Finally, internet centralization, which again is also not live on the site quite yet. Um, it, we worked with outside researchers um, to measure how centralized um, the internet is. And basically what we're um, 
looking for there is how many players are there that own the actual physical infrastructure of the internet um, from companies to governments to, um, you know, who owns the fiber cables, who owns the networks, who owns the, you know, the, the servers, who owns, et cetera. Um, we are not judging whether this is good or bad. Um, we are certainly, we don't want to um, say that central, central Asian has any sort of value judgment to it, uh, but we are going to be doing is measuring it over time. So the goal um, will be once we release this, which should be in the fall at some point, um, we will keep doing this year over year to sort of see if it changes. Um, and this is globally, this is not uh, focused on a particular region. Um, the methodology for this will also be released prior to um, the actual data, but I'm not, we're not entirely sure when that will be yet. That, that's a little further behind in the, um, in the process. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to um, email us at isoc underscore pulse. Oh, sorry, our Twitter is isoc underscore pulse. Um, our email is pulse at isoc.org. You can reach out to me. Um, my email is olmstead at isoc.org. Um, we love ideas for this project. We really want to be collaborating with the community for everything. Um, if you have ideas for new areas, if you want to add something to one of the current areas, um, please feel free. Um, and again, we um, do take guest blogs as well. Um, we write blogs about everything. So all the three, four projects I just mentioned also have blogs where we write stories about the data. Um, we also take guest blogs on really any topic. So if you want to, if you want to write a blog about DNSSEC or IPv6 or whatever, um, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to, um, to work with you on that. Um, and yeah, I think that's, yeah, thank you again for your, um, your time. And please, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, if you have any questions about the resilience, that's a really interesting project, but frankly, I don't have time right now. So reach out to me offline. I'd be happy to really dive into that one if you like numbers and graphs. <laughs> so thank you. Muchas gracias, Kenneth, por tu presentación. Elisa, ¿tenemos alguna pregunta? Hola, Paula. Thank you, Kenneth, for your presentation. Are there any questions? Ale, any questions? Sí, hay una yes, pregunta. Yes, indeed, there is en, one question. En la sección de Q&A. There is one question. El señor in the Oscar Robles Garay la está realizando. Mr. Oscar Robles Garay. La voy a leer en español, sin embargo, está en inglés. Kenneth, la podrás buscar en el Q&A. Kenneth, you have it in the Q&A. It's already in English. It's already in English. Las mediciones centralizadas les van a generar algún estimado de medición de años previos o solamente mediciones del momento. Sorry, could you repeat that? My audio cut out for a second there. Uh, you, you have it in the Q&A. Okay, great. It's already in English. Oh, great. Yep. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, we we're going to do um, going forward. We actually attempted to go for previous years, but we couldn't get strong data. Um, we actually did do last year. We did 2019 and 2020. But prior to that, it was really hard to find good data for the model we're building, unfortunately. Um, so no, I mean, well, starting in 2019, going forward. But before that, we just couldn't get good data sources, unfortunately. Okay, no hay más preguntas por ahora. Paula. There are no more questions so far. Paula. Good. Thank you, Ale, and thank you, Kenneth. Thanks thank a lot, much. Kenneth. So we go on with the next presentation by Rodrigo Peña, who's a consultant in Chile, and he's going to talk about ASPAT open source software for root collection. Rodrigo, you'll have 20 minutes for your presentation, so go ahead. Welcome. Am I sharing the screen? There it is. Perfect. Wonderful. So I'm Rodrigo. Thank you for introducing me. Today, I'm presenting this software that I have been working at this last year. Precisely, it's an open source uh, software to monitor route collectors. In this last year, we I worked with different uh, ISPs, uh, uh, IP providers, uh, small and medium sized, and I've seen shared problems. I've spent 25 hours in BDP, VH internet, trying to identify routing problems and using all sorts of tools. Now, if you go through the same, you spend a long time in BDP, uh, in, in those uh, 
um, uh, problems, or you may be technical users that you like what uh, the routing is uh, happens. One of the our missions is that when we, we receive calls that uh, a page is or a site is not uh, working in a carrier, we start uh, uh, we we start uh, seeing what happens. Uh, if if things occur uh, properly, then we do it uh, ahead of time. So we do a ping trying to see whether we reach destination and when we start uh, going more in detail we start using show ip p trace router uh, show ip bgp and here it, it comes more difficult because this tool bg play is, is developed by massimo who will uh, give a presentation later but these tools do not reflect our border route but other route collectors or the global route the global table now in this case the way i proceed to find to to reach the uh, route border is through our routing table and in the case of microtech this may be a complicated decision we know the people that have used microtech will understand this animation it really feels like that after the after 15000 20000 addresses uh, when you go to this uh, uh, to see here you may either know what's happening or you it's maybe it's better to uh, leave it alone uh, so as not to explode everything. So it's a problem to know what happens in our networks using the tools available. It can be very slow. So let's imagine that uh, this doesn't get frozen, but still the problem may have hap already gone and you didn't find anything. And when you find your command list to show how you can solve it, by the time you find that it's late it's been solved but you don't have to feel bad because we are never uh, 24 7 monitoring to see this now the users will be claiming so and you have two options either you go on with your life because everybody happened or you can do a post-mortem analysis to avoid our network from suffering a similar event in the future personally i think that investigating this type of event is extremely important to get uh, to make our uh, network more robust, but also because we shouldn't feel reassured when these events are taking place because they may be deleterious for the users or for third parties. So if you are like me, you won't be happy unless you find the root cause of a problem. So if you are like me and you want to know really what happened in that event what happens if i tell you that there's a way you can historically go through the routing tables of your border router interactively from home from your navigator well that's what we've been doing in recent times trying to make this possible with aspect this is the software that i'm developing i managed to implement a, a bgp router from your own routers or even from information of third parties. So just as many USPs capture metadata of the sessions of their of the users with NetFlow and they feed the database with this software, I want to do something similar, but with the uh, border route um, table so that you may have a historical registry of how it moves. Originally, the intention of this software was simply to do a BGP, uh, .net, uh, but open source. But as you develop software, you find the, strength, the strengths and the most interesting things uh, so that we can make the most of them. Because although I'm going to do a lot of BGP uh, .net, it won't be too useful because it, I may be repeating things. In the end, the most important thing that I achieved when designing the software is that it can be deployed privately. So each of you may have in your own management networks, you can review your own tables and you don't have to publish anybody to the rest. To, so, so you ensure confidentiality of your networks. All this is under MIT license and I'm going to explain what it's all about later. How does it work? Here you see an animation of how you see the interface of the software. If you look at the left column, 
you have different filters that you can use simultaneously. All this is happening in the navigator and you can explore through the many routes, 20,000, 40,000. And I have one with a complete table and I've seen that it works up to 120,000. So until, uh, so here, it, it may be infiltrated by the length of the prefix and you look for what you need to find. Well, an incident may be a BGP hijack or a BGP leap or other situations that may go from range from very serious to something that is quite neglectable. So the, a very, a, it's a good interface, but let's see really how it works. When I was developing the first filters that are the ones that you see in the animation, I found an important, an interesting case. A typical case that I found is to look for strange announcements, things that I don't think, I don't know whether they should be in a routing table or in a global uh, traffic uh, table. If you look at the animation, I'm looking through the mnem mnemonics, for instance, from one to 12, and usually the, these are used as examples. And if you look at it, when I'm reaching block 11, there are announcements that seem a bit strange. For instance, a LACNIC IP provider should not have a be here, so and I should not have an IP block. And then I see that that belongs to the Department of Defense uh, in the United States that is being announced in Chile. So although there are no users, it's wrong. So you don't have to accept that kind of announcements in the networks, but only those that might affect the network. So here we have discovered a BGP hijack using this tool. Another case that I found, and all this has been reported, we try to manage this. Okay, so another case was a BGP leak, which I saw in this interface. I'm using more than one filter here simultaneously. And if you pay attention, I first looked up with the Microsoft AS using the name. And that is one of the unfortunate things of this tool, because it also, it's one of the things that you have this tool, you maintain the name. So in this case, Microsoft had the ASN the 8075 and 8062. So in that way, I was able to look up the two simultaneously because Microsoft is in Chile with two points of presence. I thought it would be short ASPATH, but one is quite long. And then with shortening with the ASPATH filter, we found the BGP leak. This was reported and then solved. How do we implement the ASPATH software in your organizations? Or also, as I had said, there are two different ways of using this. You can use it without using the border router, using third party information. Also the information you obtain from your own routers. We normally applying two methods to apply this. One is using the Quagga dump grabber. And so the software can accept any show IPDP and this is then purposed and included in the database so then you can work with all the pch dumps which is this that provides routing snapshots of all the route collectors so much of the information was available before but it wasn't so easy to have it because pch only publishes the files and this we, we can visualize and this can also be done through the go bgp collector this is how you can include your own routing table and bgp so, uh, uh, information in the software how does this software work well this chart shows the software component we have a front end which is the interface that you can explore we have a back end made up by different processes. The grabbers are all the processes that allow you to obtain the routing tables from external sources, whether the routers or PCH, for example, special websites. Once we have the data sets in our database, we start processing this. For the PCH database, we have a Quagga parser. And then the software converts 
the entire data set to SQL, and this is finally stored relationally in the PostgreSQL and Timescale DB. This is because although we apparently are working with big data, this is not the case. And this is because we are querying this, which ends up being efficient. Now, as to how to implement this, let me show you a chart which is quite simple. You, if you have a server that does a virtualization with Docker, you will have three containers, one for the database, one for the front end and back end, and the third one with a GoBGP. So in this way, you can implement this software with any vendor that supports BGP. There's no problem with that. You can use Cisco, Power, Juniper, Microtik, whichever you wish. But there is some subtle difference maybe between, for example, Microsoft, Microtik does not support the ASPath. And this is something that was mentioned this event, but ASPath will allow you to do uh, BGP, uh, Go BGP uh, routing table. So then you can have the historic information available. This is in development. We have been working for this one year, the design and also determining how we can progress. And hopefully in this semester and the coming months, we hope to have a stable launching. This is available in the site. And if you know how to uh, develop, you can also collaborate because this is a project that can be worked on jointly. We're going to have a stable launching of the version. And so if you have colleagues who are using this, maybe you can exchange this information. And then a call to all the network operators that might be interested in this software or also developers, particularly the back end of this software has been done on Python and the front is being developed in JavaScript. Ruby was then rolled out in order to maintain a more familiar ecosystem with the networks because Python is basically what is being used at present. I also invite you to visit the website of the project and to subscribe to the newsletter if you wish to receive news on the project and once it is stable, to operate. But if you wish to test the software in its initial stages, you are welcome to so. And the final detail, MIT license, what does this mean? This means that you can do any use and distribution and modification of the software without any limitations. In this way, we eliminate any friction, any legal friction that you might have. And if you have a software engineer device in your companies starting tomorrow or even after this presentation, you can start working on the project and adapt it to your own needs and hopefully contribute. So you can adapt this and there are no legal issues involved. So if you have any questions, please do it through the Zoom Q&A. And in the meantime, we still have some time available and I will show you how this works in real life. I'm now running it in my computer. This is a, a deployment of the app that I have. I think you can view my screen. So it's quite simple. The most important thing is the list here. If you look at this I'm monitoring two route collectors, and this is the traffic exchange points, and I have all this information. I have a database with all the autonomous systems. You can do a search with the names, like the one of Microsoft, or you have the routing snapshots, which have to do with the historic information in order to check it. So let us see here the internet exchanges. Here, Kavasi wanted to test this out for some time. And I'm trying with PIT Chile. These two are IXPs where you have CH data collectors. So here I can show you the routes. For example, let's look at PIT Chile. So if you pay attention, the last snapshot available is from December 21st, 2020. And here we can repeat the experiment. I'm going to put the filter for the IP block in order to find these announcements, which as at December 21st was still available. 
So let us see if they are present at right now. If I go over to Kabasi, this is May 11th, this is yesterday in Kabasi, and I can look up the same lock. And in fact, this hijack, BGP hijack, is announced by Kabasi through Internexus, through the ASN. Yes, right. So here, this is a brief demo. We don't have so much time left for questions. Uh, there is a question, yes. Good morning. I'd like to try the software. Which email should I send my request to? Well, I recommend entering the website. And here you have more information on the project. And I'm also uh, available in the Discord of the event. So after the presentation, we can speak if you're interested in de joining the development or whatever. So there are more questions. Okay. Yes, I'm Alejandra Costa. Hi. Very briefly, Rodrigo. I see that you're paying attention to everything. In the chat, there is a question from Maximiliano Colus who says, Rodrigo, if you don't have 40 gate support, can I still have set up a parser? Well, that is a type of collaboration we're looking for. I will try to do things so that we can have a Quagga parser. But yes, you can clone the repository and become an active collaborator for the project. We can discuss this, of course, and agree so that you can I can assist you in deploying this software, and then you can start trying out your parser of FortiGate. And speaking about vendors, one way would be in that way, in order to import data sets from the show IPDP, or also I can do this through Go BGP, and then you can do your FortiGate, and so have the route in the standard manner. But in the future, maybe we might not even need Go BGP and use a different implementation in addition to the proposed one. And I see there are no more questions. So otherwise, I will be available at the Discord. And hopefully, you can also subscribe to the newsletter. This is the project website. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you for your presentation. We still have a few minutes left, so I would like to encourage you to take the opportunity to send in your questions to the Q&A, if you have any questions for Rodrigo. So please take opportunity to do so. Here we have a question in the Q&A. Augusto Maturin is asking the following. Rodrigo, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, yes, I'm reading the question. Are you working on a manual for installing and setting up the entire environment? Well, good question. The idea is to make this as simple as possible. We're trying to make this that this can provide support and that you can move the folder between servers. You just need to have docking and an IP address. So we'll be working on the documentation. But the focus is always on the fact that this is not only for development purposes. You do need to use Python for development purpose, for installing it, yes. As an ISV, you don't need to do so. So that would be it. Thank you. Ariel, my congratulations, very good project. Soon I will be joining you as a GitHub collaborator. Yes, we have been in contact with Ariel for quite some time. And part of this also is related to something he had in the past, had done in the past. So people are also congratulating you in the chat. So we now invite you to send your questions to Rodrigo through the email. Please include your email address in the chat. So if people have any questions in the future, and also to the other speakers we had already this morning. So now we go 
we'd like to thank Rodrigo once again, and we'll continue with the next speaker, Ariel Antigua, who is a systems security coordinator. He will be speaking about automating BIRD and having BGP without dying in the attempt. Ariel, you have 10 minutes for your presentation. You have the floor. Saludos. So, hi, I'm Ariel Antigua. I'm system security coordinator with a certain love for BGP. So, I think it has happened to many people that you have had inconveniences when working this. The idea with the presentation the is to of the presentation. show you how to do configurations to have bird. As many of you are aware, bird is a routing suite. And the idea of my presentation is to show you this tool called BCG, which is a configuration generator. So this is a project of GitHub to which I applied some changes in order to have configurations that I wish to have in some routers. One of the advantages of having this with BCG is that I can have the configuration file. I can store it in Git and then I can control the entire configuration. Another possibility is to have Ansible, and with Ansible, we can automate. We can automate and uh, synchronously uh, confirm it. Uh, in a network scenario, we have a server, a Linux server, and we convert it into a router using BERT. We have only one server. The task will be relatively easy because it's only one uh, configuration uh, file. And it gets a bit more complicated when we have three, four, five uh, uh, connections uh, of the different participants. In each server, we would have the BCG tool. And with this app, we uh, may have a YAML file for each. Uh, and uh, there you have a configuration. And there we no longer have to use any filters because we can work independently. Here I'm showing you a small network scenario encompassing the routers of other ISP. Here you have the an ISP, but we wouldn't focus on this part. It's the routers that we control. So here we have uh, the different routers, RT, uh, uh, 01, 02, etc. And here we would be making the changes in RTR02. There we acquire a connection with an IXP and we would do peering with a route server and uh, potentially peering with other members of that IXP. And so this is a small example of a config YAML and here we see that we have an autonomous, uh, an ASN 65100, a router ID. Here we have the prefixes that we have been assigned by LACNIC or other RIRs. And here you see a small, so the global configuration options. All this is in IML. All, all the possibilities for configuring. And here we have a peer space. And here we decide which of the, which be remote routers 
for a session. Here we see we have an ASN 64125. We have the name, the type, it's peered, and I gave the two IPs with which I would be establishing the session. Here we have other options that we can add to our config.yml, and it also supports uh, JSON. If you like YAML, uh, well, if you don't like YAML, you may use JSON. One of the dependencies of BCG is the we we must execute BCG uh, if uh, in order to do that we have to install the BGP Q4 and uh, we this is the limit of the prefixes that we are going to use. In the 2004 version of Ubuntu, we have to install BGP4 manually. And we now it's already available in uh, the fourth version. You don't have to download it specifically. We are being told that we are, when we are told that we are ready to, for a session with an IXP, in this case, an IXP DO, We are about to start operate. After the configuration, we may have a dry run session, and we'll see that the uh, that we validate that the configuration is correct, and then we can execute the BCG, uh, and this creates all the configurations in the directory by default, and there you will have all the configurations. As, and the tool reloads. That is, the tool starts a dim so that it will um, load all the configuration. These are the options available when we execute this tool uh, debug, dry run, non generate UI. And we have an option so that the configuration generated here we have it uh, in YAML, TAML, or JSON etc. And uh, we can use the default. Here you see a screenshot executing VCG and you see that everything happened perfectly well. So bird dot uh, conf is the main configuration file that we have available. Now, if the tool doesn't support any additional uh, configurations, you can create manual files with this format, include manual, oh, the name, the asterisk, and it will load this configuration in the process. This is an example. You may have the case that I may need uh, configuration and you're going to load it this way. Here we see what we created when we executed. Uh, this is the file, it's the autonomous system and the name that I decided to give it. Let's run it very quickly. There you have the screen, and here you put, you see that I only have two sessions. These are the other routers that I control. And here I'll add, I saved this. I'm going to log in to the IXP. And here I executed my process. It reconfigures everything that was in the setting. And then I see a new action, XP here. Uh, unfortunately, here we don't have IPv6, but it was established in IPv4. So the session was in, 
established in IXP. And it added these lines. Now, if I want to connect with the peer, it's in the same network of the IXP. And I run the file, the executable. And here I see that there is a new BGP session. In this case, I put peer number one. For one reason or the other, I decided to have a direct session with this. So it's simple. You can survive without dying trying. The project is very good. You can look at it. The idea is to have just one tool. The time is over. Do you have any questions? I leave the presentation. Thank you, Ariel, for your presentation. Yes, we do have a few minutes for questions. So we invite the audience to ask questions. So write them in the Q&A. And in the meantime, I'll ask Ale whether there are any hands raised. No, at present, nobody has raised uh, their hand. But we invite people to make the most of this opportunity. Now here, there's a question. A question by Pablo Umansor. He says, good morning. BCG, is, is BGP compatible with a version 2.x of BIRD 1.6 or both? At present, it's compatible with 2.x. Thank you. Um, and now, Mr. Santiago Ajo, here we have, he asks, very good work. What are the differences with a, an, with a route server? Well, the route server is a server, but the engine that generates configurations is oriented to uh, Router server. BCG is for to configure my Linus the router. Well, thank you, Ariel. Well, you, we may have time for one more. Yes, please go ahead. Well, no questions, rather comments. Edgar Rojas says, excellent initiative. Ms. Mauricio also says, excellent presentation, Ariel. Thank you.